In this episode of the BFR Better for Results podcast, we sit down and talk with Nick Colosi, who's a chiropractor and the founder and CEO of Smart Tools Plus, a blood flow restriction training and instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization manufacturer. We sit down and talk about the recent release of his Generation 4 Smart Cuffs, what goes into making a product ready for sale, as well as the challenges of meeting the extremely high expectations of his customers. I hope you enjoy the episode. What's up, what's up, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the BFR Better for Results podcast. I'm here today with founder and president of Smart Tools, uh, Nick Colosi. We share the same name, so we must be similarly cool. But, you know, that's just my opinion. Anyways, um, I'm excited about this episode because it's going to be a little bit different than some of the episodes that I've put up in the past in that Nick is no longer an active clinician but he is a developer of the Smart Tools BFR device, and this is now on its fourth generation. And so today I want to talk to him about the, the challenges, the tribulations of, of creating BFR, what the barriers have been, and everything in between. So welcome to the show, Nick. Yeah. For those that don't, uh, don't have any background on you, just talk about how you kind of ended up in the space. Sure. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Um, yeah. So there's going to be a lot of Nick's going back and forth. You also have a Nick, uh, a Nick yep. working for you too. Right. So like on those email chains, it's like, which Nick are you talking? There's like three Nicks plus my dad's my last name, name Nick. has Nick. So there's in potentially it well. four Nicks on the email chain. And my uh, last name has Nick in it. So, <laughs> Oh, that's right. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Um, yeah, so I so my name is Nick Closey, president founder of Smart Tools. Uh, we make the Smart Tools for ISTM and then Smart Cuffs for BFR. Those are our two main products. Um, started the company in 2014, so we're going on going on 10 years now. Um, we did ISTM for we started with that in 2014, and then we got into BFR starting in 2018. Um, you know, just with a hand pump and uh, and cuff, and then uh, that kind of evolved into a hand pump, cuff, and Doppler. Um, those were those were easier days, to be honest with you. Uh, those are those are very low entry into manufacturing uh, for those parts because I mean the cuff, yeah, you have to manufacture the cuff. However, the hand pump, you know, you're talking off the shelf right uh and then modifying the hose uh with, with a connector so um those are very easy to market as you know you'll see a lot of those products on the market now um there's a bazillion of them you know um easy to easy to copy so um there's a lot out there so because there's not that much engineering involved um and there's it's a low cost uh to you know to, to entry so um, yeah, so we, uh, so we got that in 2018, 2019. And then, you know, as we, as we got onto the market, kind of got built our name up a little bit, um, mainly clinical, um, you know, people are less like, we, we need a more automated solution. Um, something that's not, <clears throat> not so much training intensive. Um, they all get training, but there's a skill involved with a handheld Doppler. Um, not so much for the arm. Anybody can do the arm, you know, the, the, you know, the, uh, radio pulse but like the leg pulse very tricky um especially in standing people can't stand still um and it kind of throws everything off uh finding the arterial pulse so we found this out you know through our courses everybody's just like this is uh this is kind of difficult um and and you have to have two people you can't do it yourself so that kind of takes away the home market um you know with patients wanting to to, to do bfr at home um, I couldn't do it um, because they didn't they didn't have somebody either qualified to to use a handheld Doppler um, or they just, you know, you don't have enough hands uh, uh, to do that. So so we started developing the uh, the Gen 3 model, the 3.0 in 20 end of 2018, 2019 ish. Um, and then we developed it for over about 18 months. And then uh, and then we launched it in January of 2020. Uh, so, uh, that was awesome timing on our part. Um, totally sarcastic, uh, because that was a nightmare, uh, with COVID, um, you know, people, 
you know, are at home. Uh, there was a lot of, I hate to use the word uncertainty because every time I hear uncertainty, I sound, I, I cringe um, in regards to COVID, but like, um, uh, yeah, like as far as supply chain goes, complete mess, complete mess on the supply chain front. It was, it was, it was a, it was a learning experience and, you know, we learned a ton, um, you know, being our first electronic product, uh, being COVID, having all these components on the circuit board and all these, it was just, just, like I said, it was a massive learning experience, um, on our part. And, um, we really didn't get out of that really until probably early summer of 2021, um, is when we really kind of got out of that hole, um, as far as back orders go, you know, bug fixing and things like that for the 3.0. So, um, you know, we, yeah, then we wrote that, you know, we're, we, we still have that product. It's a great product. Um, I think we we're in, we probably moved about 30,000 of those units, something like that. Some 30,000 3.0s globally. Um, so it, it's, it's definitely out there. Um, and you know, Gosh, there's there's cuffs out there that we made since uh, uh, 2017, 2018. We still have cuffs that are out there still in the field operating um, with no problems. Um, so, you know, yeah, the cuffs, I mean, these cuffs are not like, you know, your typical blood pressure cuffs. They're used and abused. Like it is you're normally not exercising uh, under load um, with a blood pressure cuff that's inflated to 100 or 200 millimeters of mercury. Like that's just not normal uh, for these air bladders. So yeah, so then, uh, so yeah, so then we started developing the 4.0 in uh, right around 2020. Uh, it, that was always the original goal was the 4.0. Um, we, were, we were not meant to do the 3.0, but we wanted to, kind of slow walk it a little bit um, and kind of work out some of the kinks because this is our first foray, as you say, <laughs> as, as you can say, uh, into electronics. So we really, we didn't want to jump into electronics, jump into Bluetooth, the app and do all this stuff, um, you know, never developing electronic device from the ground up. Um, so, so that's why we did the 3.0 as more so as a bridge. And then uh, the 4.0 we came out with last spring. Um, and that's, quickly has become the more popular device naturally uh it just does more more modes you know that you know it's just a, that's just a better product um we probably sell those about two to one uh compared to our 3.0 currently so um yeah but i mean i offering you know, two different devices one bluetooth one non-bluetooth um it offers flexibility for people you know some people just don't want to deal with bluetooth others like yeah i want all the modes i want all the bells and whistles uh so they go with the 4.0 um, you know, we, we do large military orders and they can't use Bluetooth, uh, from a security point of view. Uh, so they, they opt with the 3.0. So we work with a lot of military bases globally, but mainly domestically. Um, yeah, I mean, they order a lot at a time, uh, to, you know, to fulfill their, their needs. So, um, yeah, you know, between all, you know, between all that, you know, we do education. Yes. Um, you know, do live courses moving more towards, you know, digital, um, just from the feedback from people. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, well, it's, and, and you know, it's a crazy world of education. <laughs> well, it's so funny that you say the digital, yeah. right? Because yeah. so, so as you know, I do a hybrid model and, um, and it's just so funny because you can't, what I've learned and, 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 and I know that we've spoken about this offline, you can't please everyone. Mm -hmm. And what's so funny is that people will say, oh, I like, like, I don't want to like so heavy science when you're in like the, the, the actual education course, mm -hmm. but then you put on, like we, we have our on-demand course. So we require four and a half hours of them completing it so we can get in and hit the ground running yeah the, it's a minority but it's a it's a it's a minority that you know noticeable they're like this is way too much pre-course work way too much. so it's like you get you you can't win either way you damn just, if you do damn if you don't so, so <laughs> the, thing, yeah. the thing that that i always go back to is and this was like probably like two and a half three years ago when mm -hmm. we were chatting and i launched the on-demand course because now it's been we launched in 2020 so it's been mm -hmm. three plus years and 
we were getting feedback that was very good. And you were like, yeah, if you get a seven or a seven or of, out of 10 or above, you're, you're golden because yeah. it's, and, and it's so funny because the mm-hmm. vast majority of our feedback is, is excellent, but the, there is a minority that's like, this is, this is way too in depth or like, yeah, it's, it's, it's like education on BFR is so challenging because it's there's so many things that you have to consider and at the same time respect that a lot of people aren't as interested in the fine details as sure. some of the people that are are like teaching it so mm-hmm. you have to balance that out but it's so funny cuz like people are going digital and and they're still going to complain they're going to complain about <laughs> it's it's just you know i always tell yeah i always tell my fiance it's like hey if i want to please everybody i'd sell ice cream like because i there's nothing you can do to please everybody it's impossible um that's just business you know that's just business it's but it's whatever i mean you're gonna have your good and bad days you're gonna have you're gonna have somebody you just can't please it's just it is what it is you know um you know i see it every day um, more, thankfully the positive outweighs the negative. Like a lot, of, a lot yeah. of people love the product, right. Or we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't be moving as much as, as we are. Um, and the demand wouldn't be so high. Um, but it, it's interesting, you know, it, it's interesting. Um, it, it's fun. You know, I love doing it. You know, um, you know, I used to be a clinician, chiro- uh, chiropractor, um, and, uh, I stopped practicing about six or seven years ago, something like that. Cause I was kind of doing both at the same time. And, um, I realized I can't do that. Um, it was kind of treading water in both like smart tools was like sucking. <laughs> like it was like doing maybe like 30, $50,000 a year. Um, this was, yeah, this is when I first started and, and I'm just like, and then my practice, I'm just like, okay, this is slow. And this, so then I was just, it was just, yeah. uh, I, I went full time and then it just absolutely skyrocketed, uh, probably sometime around 2016, uh, when I went full time. And uh, kind of just been doing it ever since, you know, and just constantly looking for ways to improve um, not only the product, but certain product categories, product mar- uh, and markets. Um, you know, we're always looking, you know, we're not just a smart, we're not just an ISTM company. We're not just a BFR company. Um, we're constantly looking, uh, you know, for, you know, for new products to develop. And, you know, we're, we're developing a new product right now, um, about, about a year and a half, two years away. But um but that's usually the life cycle of a product development. Um, but uh, so, yeah, I mean, we're, we're um, really excited for where we're at, you know, where we're going. Um, BFR is exciting uh, just because, you know, hearing the stories from clinicians, it's, it's awesome. You know, they're just like, you know, these people are recovering significantly quicker. Um, they're tolerating it more, but as you probably know, patient tolerance is really dependent on how you deliver it. It's really not so much product specific. It's how you deliver that product um, and, and how you deliver that, those protocols. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and we always say undercook before you overcook, right. Don't just jump them right into 80% LOP and just, you know, volitional failure. And there's like, this person's like never exercised before in their life. And they're just going to like, get this thing off of me. Mm-hmm. Uh, so like there's, 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 you know, there's trade-offs, you know, and there's, there's way to ways to do it and there's ways not to do it. And sometimes you see it. And, and we talk about this a lot. You see, you see crap on Instagram. And you're just like, Oh my God, what are you doing? Um, like the cuff placement's not correct pressures or what like it, it just it's just insane so sometimes you know um you know education is just it's just paramount um whether it be clinical or non-clinical to to athletes and, and patients in general so i want to i want to change gears and talk about the evolution of your product line so mm-hmm. the the biggest thing that i remember is in about your gen one is that it had a multi-chambered bladder system sure and then you transitioned with the gen two to a mm-hmm. single chambered system yeah and i kind of want to go and just hear what what made you make that transition what was the the feedback the difficulties associated with that transition from gen one to gen two sure yeah, so in 2017, when we first started to develop the Gen 1, it was a multi-chamber bladder system. <clears throat> Quickly, um, we realized, I think, I can't remember when that study came out, but um, handheld Doppler um, were like, hey, we can find LOP 
which was always the goal from the beginning. We just couldn't do it non-electronically, I guess you can say. And we're like, well, we can do this with a handheld Doppler. Problem is you can't do that with a multi-chamber bladder system because it's not going to find occlusion. So you really can't set that absolute pressure, right? So we're like, okay, well, what we can do is a single chamber bladder system that will get you full occlusion. Um, our manufacturer, he's, our manufacturer's done, has been doing this for quite a while. He's in, uh, in the States and he's just like, yeah, we used to do, <clears throat> used to use multi-chamber bladder systems for a uh, space application, uh, just because they didn't want full occlusion there. Um, so from, from a purely safety point of view, but it wasn't for BFR purposes. It was, mm -hmm. it was for something completely different. So it's just like, yeah, you want to go single if you want to get full occlusion. So I'm like, all right, let's, let's go full single. So probably within, I think, honestly, we probably were only on the market for maybe three or four weeks with that Gen 1 device. And we quickly pivoted to the Gen 2 very quickly. Um, and, that, and, yeah, and then, yeah, that was, uh, we're like, hey, we're finding LOP, you know, with handheld Doppler and a hand pump and a cuff, you know, single chamber bladder system. Um, you know, we use a, we use an air bladder system. So it kind of balances both comfort and um stiffness so it's a hybrid bladder it's not your typical all nylon bladder um it is a hybrid um we still use that to this day um up until the gen 4 where we kind of modified the bladder a little bit more to accommodate having um you know having to pump permanently fixed to the cuff there's there's some engineering challenges with that so um but, yeah talk uh, about yeah talk about the 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 bladder design so i think um, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of, there, there's a lot of growing interest in blood flow restriction, but people are really unaware of some of the different ways in which the different device characteristics and features may impact the, the, the physiological stimulus. Sure. And I'm very much interested in hearing about what things that you had to consider making this transition to a single chambered system what variables were you paying attention to as yeah. a manufacturer and why? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Go, first of all, the single chamber system was merely to find LP. That was the number one reason, uh, finding limb occlusion pressure, being able to personalize uh, the pressures to the person. That was goal number one, because that's kind of the gold standard for BFR. And that's what we wanted to stay at. Um, we had such a clinical, uh, we're so entrenched in a clinical market up to that point. Um, we wanted to be, as close to the evidence as possible, um, but making, you know, being affordable uh, and also being easily accessible. Um, that was, that, that was a biggie. Um, yeah. So as far as the bladder goes, um, we use a bladder material that's almost, I don't want to say a gel because it's not a gel, um, but when it inflates, it doesn't pinch. So it doesn't really, it doesn't come to a point. So if you inflate a normal bladder, um, it will kind of have these pinch points. Uh, just because it doesn't, um, it doesn't, it's, an, it's not flexible enough. Uh, so what we found is certain materials that we use for the bladder, um, kind of when it inflates, it kind of inflates almost like a gel to where it uh, has no pinch points. So it inflates and it fully encloses the limb without any pinch points. So it increases the, the comfort factor. Um, that's the most important thing uh, as far as the comfort factor goes, because, you know, we're like, okay, we can find LLP now, but let's improve patient compliance and patient use. And if it's not comfortable, although BFR inherently is not going to be comfortable. So we're like, okay, how do we make this as comfortable as possible um, uh, without being too much? Um, and that's what we did. And that's what we did with the bladder, um, making it just more flexible. Um, but we also don't want it to inflate like a balloon, right? Because if you inflate it like a balloon, uh, it's going to greatly affect um, the LOP calibration in our algorithms. So, um, you know, we use an internal stiffener. Um, it's there. That's what, that's that plastic piece. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and it, so it kind of keeps it everything together. Doesn't inflate like a balloon, inflate like a balloon, and then doesn't have any pinch points. So that's the function of the internal stiffener. Correct. Yeah. Okay. That's how we use it. I mean, that, that's, that's, use... that's why we had, that's why it's there. If you didn't have an internal stiffener, what what would that do? It would it would basically make it such the bladder inflates more like a balloon and less like a gel. Yeah, so it's gonna uh, not so much less like a gel, but it's gonna inflate like a balloon as opposed to directing all that air pressure to the limb. 
Yeah, because the, the bladder is around the limb and then the plastic inserts around that. So it's on the outside of it, right? So uh, when it inflates and it's tight, right? So when it inflates, it's going to inflate that air towards the limb. So, so the, internal the, stiffener, that pl the internal stiffener itself is a plastic covering that goes right, right. overneath the bladder. The so second piece. When it does inflate, then that natural resistance to getting you know, altered that it's stiffness, I guess. Correct. So yep. create that shape and allow the transmission of that air to the underlying limb. Correct. Right. Okay. Correct. Cool. And then be between that and our unique bladder system um, presented other challenges that ne we needed to do and modify for our pressure algorithms. So LP maintain its accuracy. Um, we actually filed for a patent on that, on the LP algorithm about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago. Um, so it's looking good. We're hopefully, I mean, because nobody else out there that filed for that. So um, we're really confident um, in, in getting that patent approved. But patents, you know, they take forever. You know, and they, they, they take absolutely forever. It's a lot of paperwork. Everybody that does manufacturing knows that. Um, it's a, it's a, just a big game. Uh, well, but, that's, uh, that's another point, I think you know, I'd like to hear about is, is kind of the proprietary algorithm that yeah. you're using for LOP. What is the basis of that? First of all, yeah. for those yeah. that might not be familiar, which I would say is very little, but just for the random person that's not, not familiar with uh, standardizing pressure, limb occlusion pressure is the minimum pressure needed to completely restrict all blood flow distally. And so that's basically like getting your blood pressure taken, but with a specific cuff that has a specific material, a specific width, whatever. It doesn't matter. LOP is variable. And so there's different ways in which people have determined LOP. We already mentioned one about the Doppler, but um, there are also a lot of automatic ways to apply to determine LOP. And so the, so I'm interested in how that process kind of went about. And I think you're, that's the algorithm that was validated. Um, um, the, yeah, yeah. That was the algorithm that was validated. Um, the 4.0 is in validation now. Actually, I have to double check. I know USF was working on some stuff too, but um, yeah. So we had a modifier out. We have two different algorithms, obviously, because they're two completely different products. So the Gen 3 has a different algorithm than Gen 4. Um, it's just, it's not, um, it's, it's just completely two different, um, construction. Uh, right. So the 3.0, uh, you plug it in uh, from a pump, you plug it into the cuff it runs, then you unplug it and then it holds the pressure. Uh, the 4.0, the pump is permanently affixed to the cuff. So that presents all the challenges. Uh, so the algorithms have to be completely different. Um, so it, it's more comfortable. The 4.0 is significantly faster. It doesn't stop and start. It doesn't use a step-up method, right? So the Gen 3 has a step-up method where you inflate, stop, inflate, stop, inflate, stop. Um, and then the Gen 4 just runs. Uh, the pump just runs until it finds occlusion. Um, we're able to do that um, with other things that we filed patents for. Uh, we're able to do that and, um, and find the LOP uh, without stopping. It's just more comfortable. It's faster generally, uh, especially for the upper extremity. Lower extremity, we had to do, do some trade-offs, right? So we had to do a smaller pump um, for, or actually we used the same size pump that we used for the arm and the leg. Um, so the pump uh, it inflates in the leg about the same speed as the Gen 3, um, as far as finding LOP uh, in, in its totality, right? It's gonna, the Gen 3 is gonna inflate faster, but it has to stop. Gen mm -hmm. 4 has a, it inflates a little slower than the Gen 3, but it doesn't stop. So then it, it equates out to be about the same time uh, for LOP for the lower extremity. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, so far of the 4.0, um, you know, people really enjoy it. You know, they really like, they like the app. They like the connectivity. Um, was there bugs in the beginning? Yeah, there was. And I first to admit that any new product's going to have bugs. I mean, yeah, it, I mean, I will software and hardware. <laughs> like, I will, I, mean, I will yeah. say like when I got my hands on it there, it was very buggy in the beginning mm -hmm. and to your credit, um, I, I mean, once you, you kind of addressed it, yeah. there's, I mean, I, I have rarely, and, and so I've, I've taught at least, you know, 10, eight, 10, eight, 10, 10, 10 workshops in yeah. the last year. And 
have not. The only I will say, actually, the one problem, which is not even specific to the app, but for mm-hmm. some phones, for whatever reason, they can't. Mm-hmm. Con- it's like the Bluetooth. It's like older, mm-hmm. and it's usually with older iPhones that I find out that yeah. for whatever reason. But besides uh, that, I yeah, know- probably because they're considered. Um, they're God. What did Apple calls them a specific. I can't remember. It, it's I'm I'm having a brain fart uh, for the life of me. Uh, they're considered basically outdated, basically. So the OS operating system on those phones, they they you have to have a minimum operating system uh, for the app. To, to function. That's what I, yeah. Cause I mean, that's what I, that's what I thought something had to do. Cause, cause like it was, it, it there's never an issue um, with the calibration process with, yeah. the, with the Bluetooth pairing. And yeah. I think um, that kind of gives a good segue into the bugs and the unexpected nature of mm-hmm. releasing an electronic product. Yeah. Yeah. What is the, you know, how do you do go about QA quality assurance and yeah, how are you I responding mean, to people um, yeah. that have questions? What are the most common questions that people have, sure. like with the product? Yeah, I mean, I guess the timeline would be like, when are they asking, right? So, like when we first launched, um, there was a lot of things that we didn't see in testing. So we beta tested it, of course, and we just had no idea um, that none of these came up. You know, a, a couple of just random things, right? So, like certain like sometimes they'll leak uh or sometimes the bluetooth issue right um and we're like well that hasn't shown up in uh in our uh, quality control nor in our beta testing so um we quickly resolve those probably within about two to three months we quickly resolve those um especially the bluetooth uh that was that one was probably a tricky one uh that was hardware um now, uh, gosh, and sometimes if you're in a crowded area and those original designs, which I think we've probably replaced most of them. Um, but yeah, starting in like the summer, fall, all those, I think we may have repaired maybe five, like very minimal, like very minimal. Mm-hmm. Um, cause they're rock solid. Um, the ones that were problematic were the the original shipments, right? And we had a lot of them because we had a lot of loyal customers with our 3.0. So we had a lot of people pre-ordering uh, the 4.0. And it was buggy. You know, we had app fixes that needed to be made, um, little things here and there. But mainly the Bluetooth was was um, was a huge hurdle for us. But spent a lot more money, a lot more time uh, f- fixing that Bluetooth. Um, now, gosh, I've gotten it to where I can control two cuffs up to 60 feet. Um, which is way beyond 4.2 uh, BLE, which is, you know, Bluetooth low energy. That's what BLE stands for. And that's the model that we, you know, that's the type of Bluetooth we use. And I think the standard is like 20 feet max, 25 feet. Uh, but we were able to juice it up and get it to about 60 feet. But do you ever need it to be at 60 feet? No, you don't. Um, I will say, I will say that some of the clinicians that I, that I um, have taught have asked about the, bluetooth proximity sure. given that they are you know may, might be at a treatment table and they mm-hmm. have their client working with an aide or their their client over there that they're supervising by mm-hmm. themselves and wondering about the the connectivity because other products don't want to name other products but other products are, yeah, are yeah. don't have that bluetooth uh ability to control as, yeah, you know, outside of 10 to, to or so feet. Sure. Um, so they're questioning that. So that's good information to know. And is that a hardware thing that you guys that you guys added? Or that, is that was a hardware thing. Yeah, that was a hardware thing. Um, it was a really simple problem. It was a really simple fix. The problem was diagnosing it. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that that's good. Right. You, you don't want to have a complicated fix and a complicated diagnostic um, problem. Right. So you, it, the diagnostic took far longer. Um, it's really frustrating, too, when it doesn't happen to everybody. So it was it was environment specific. And we've told customers this. We're like, it's in, it's in your environment. Like if you're using it at like your house by yourself where there's not a lot of Bluetooth traffic, it's fine. But if you're using a busy clinic or busy gym and happened every single time. So, you know, they um, you know, we reached they reached out. We told them, you know, they replaced it for free, obviously. Um, and they haven't had problems since. So, I mean, and that's, it's been fully fixed. And so people will come to be like, Hey, I read reviews on Apple. I'm like, what those reviews were from like April when we first launched and that was version one. 
Um, and we've, you know, we've since fixed that. Um, yeah. How do you conquer kind of those? How do you conquer those that initial negative reception? And yeah, you, man, just you just gotta it use it. it. Yeah, you just gotta use it constructively. If you notice on Apple, um, we responded to every single one. Um, there's a developer response for every single one. Uh, we take those seriously, and um, and it's just part of customer service. You know, it's just part of, hey, this is the problem. You just gotta deal with it head on, right? You can't just ignore it. Mm -hmm. um, again, I know other. One other company, I'm not going to mention names. Uh, they've had the same problem for like six years and they just refuse to fix it. Um, that would drive me absolutely insane. Like that would just like, no, that because then it just your brand just keeps getting eroded away um, as being a you know reliable quality product. You know, and we assemble everything in the U.S., you know, all of our design and assemblies in the U.S. So it's not like this is being made in China. Um Pretty much like every other company, um, it, we don't do that. Uh, so everything, the assembly's here, the quality control is here. Um, I mean, it's it's the best you're gonna. It, it's the best we can do with electronics, right? Like, there's nothing more you know that we can do, and we feel really, really good about where the four point the four point oh is right now. Um, I mean, it's yeah. So yeah, you just gotta deal with them head on. You just deal with those emails head on. And those problems be like, and be as transparent as possible. You know, there's nothing to hide. We don't, you know, when we tell people, um, and then, yeah, I mean, then you don't hear from them. Right. So then there there's, and then, and then you check in on them. They're like, oh yeah, everything's been great. Uh, it's working perfectly fine. I love this thing. Um, best product out on the market. And then, so it's, you know, it's just, um, it's just that communication. It's just dealing with the, you know, deal, and the, like, I, like I said, those are all version one. Um, you know, of a brand new product. So a lot of people were very understanding of that, you know, um, any new electronic product, I don't care what market you're in. I don't care if it's Apple, Tesla, whatever. It's going to be bugs. It just mm -hmm. is what it is. Um, so yeah, we, we, uh, we're constantly improving it too. It's fun, right? So the hardware is there and with the app, it's fun because we can do all this other stuff that, you know, it, it just add modes left and right. So that's what another thing with people are just like, they just think the product is final. And I'm like, that's not the case at all. Like the hardware is there and we're constantly updating the app and constantly updating modes. Um, so we're going to launch an offline mode in about 30 days or so. Um, so it kind of, kind of mimics a 3.0 in a it way. It should be out by the time that this podcast comes out. So it should be. Okay. All right. Yeah. So that's yeah. There's a so, delay, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> so where, uh, where you inflate it, uh, you know, with the, with the app, um, you, you can work on multiple patients at one time. That's the goal of it because that's, that was one thing that our clinicians were, were giving us feedback on was mm -hmm. that, Hey, I want to be able to use it on more than just one or two patients because you can only use two cups per app. So they're just, I'm like, okay, well, it's kind of tough because, you, you know, with Bluetooth, if you close out all your other Bluetooth devices connected to your phone, you can really only connect up to six or seven on Bluetooth 4. Uh, you can do mesh, but then that creates other problems. Um, and then it becomes very problematic um, with, uh, with being able to control uh, that many cuffs. Because mm -hmm. uh, I see some other products, like you control up to 16 cuffs. I'm like, that's a lot of control and that's, and how are you going to know what you're controlling? If you're controlling up to 16 cups, we felt like that was a bit excessive. Um, so what we we're working on two things, one, uh, the offline mode. So you inflate it and then you can disconnect it, but the cuff maintains its inflation. So with that given patient, and then they can in increase the pressure, decrease, decrease the pressure or shut it off, um, with the buttons on the actual cuff on the, Oh, wow. Point. Cool. Yeah. So, um, it's basic, right? So there's only two buttons on the 4.0. So there's only so much you can do with it, but like the most important thing is shutting it off or shutting it down, uh, from a safety point of view, um, then they can just, they can do that right on, right on the app or I'm sorry, right on the uh, device. Um, and then you can go to another, uh, patient and then do the same thing. So you, theoretically you can do as many as you want because you're connecting it, inflating it, disconnecting it, but the cuff is maintaining its inflation with that patient. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. Well, I was just saying that, like, is does the cuff have a sensor inside of it that can basically, oh, yeah. so does it have that? Because where my thought goes to is if it does, right, the hardware allows for it, mm -hmm. 
it, it if the mode is not passive IPC, um, you know, something where mm -hmm. along the lines of like a built-in safety mechanism could be like if there's no like pressure change against the cuff in 30 seconds or so, then it deflates or something like that. Oh, where I see what you're saying. Add in another measure of, of yeah. safety to the application. Because um, mm -hmm. I know, for example, one other cuff, they have like, if they don't sense a contraction, they don't sense five contractions based on the cadence, mm -hmm. then it will shut off and deflate as no, another yeah. kind of yeah. built-in safety mechanism. Even though I think BFR is extremely safe. Sure. Like, that's like not that much of a concern, but I, I can understand, I guess, yeah, the clinicians that are dealing with multiple patients at a time, which sure. again raises another question where it's like, what? I don't know. It's hard for me to understand why someone would be doing BFR on, on two or three separate people at the same time. Yeah. But I mean, I, I can see it. Yeah, I totally get it. And I, and I see it from a financial point of view. I see both sides of it. You know, two patients, sure, three patients pushing it. Uh, four, five, six patients, that is like, insanity um the quality of care is like cannot yeah. be high um but uh yeah i mean yeah i hear what you're saying uh you know from a safety point of view um that could possibly be done uh pressure sensors so the pressure sensors are built into the circuit board right so um and it's a common misconception i get sometimes not so much now but a lot before people will be like is there a doppler built in i'm like well a doppler is a doppler <laughs> Doppler is not part of a circuit board. It's not a, it's not a uh, board mounted component or anything like that. It's not a chip. Doppler is a handheld Doppler. I guess you can, I guess you could depend on what you consider a Doppler. I mean, there's massive Dopplers for like weather, but then there's like, you know, handheld Doppler, uh, completely to two different things. Right. Um, yeah. And I tell people, well, no, there's not a Doppler built in. It's a pressure sensor. Uh, just like you you would with a blood pressure cuff or something like that that's digital. Mm -hmm. um, when you make that connection, um, you know, that bridging that between, okay, yeah, it's like a blood pressure. They're like, oh, okay, light bulb goes on. Then they understand it and then you move on, right? So mm -hmm. they understand it from that point of view. Um, but, but yeah, so um, yeah, so between the offline mode and then multi-user mode. So um, we feel really good about where our Bluetooth is, so where we can control up to six cuffs at one time. Um, we've been beta testing it. Um, it works. Um, rolling that out is going to take a little bit more time, um, but because uh, it does, it will stress the signal a little bit. But um, mm -hmm. but it's very strong. It can handle it. Uh, but uh, but yeah, we wanted to get the offline mode out there just because people were asking about it, um, and it, it's a uh, you know, I hate using this term because it's like a corporate term, but it's low hanging fruit. Uh, I love how I say I'm not going to use it, but then I say it. So like, yeah. It's accessibility, happened. you know, it's, it's accessibility <laughs> in language. It's accessibility uh, in product. Yeah. 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 And yeah. So it's just something that clinicians were asking for. So we, we appease the clinicians um, because they're the ones that give us the best feedback, you know, because there's only so many scenarios you can test until it's out there in the wild, like, uh, like we uh, like to say. Um, so yeah, so that's um really excited about that. Um so I wanna yeah, then yeah. I wanna then pivot to accessibility, um, particularly with the gen three and gen four. Um, as yeah. somebody who doesn't have a dog in the fight, so to speak, um, mm -hmm. and have extensively used your products, the the three sure. and the four, mm -hmm. um, and have taught hundreds of clinicians with this product. Yeah. Um, the, the, the consistent feedback that I've gotten and, and I also agree with is how easy it is to set up a BFR session, um, yeah. with, with the interface that you have in your products. So yeah. I, I guess, talk me through the development process in terms sure. of the, the way that you're presenting the options to the consumer yeah. and streamlining the whole process of getting a BFR training session started. Yeah. So there's a lot of like UX and UI things. So UX stands for user experience and UI stands for user interface. So user interface is how you kind of have the, the app is laid out or the device is laid out. And then the UX stands for user experience. That's how someone interacts with your, your app, your product, your website. And you want to see 
Um, UX is very important, you know, both from a product standpoint, but also from a marketing advertising standpoint. And this will go, you know, this crosses, you know, product world, education, PT, whatever. You know, if your website's not converting, you know, if your website is not smooth, um, you're going to have problems, right? So you're going to have conversion problems. So that aside, <laughs> uh, yeah. So we, when we set out to create the product, we wanted it to be kind of like the Apple, right? Apple of BFR. Uh, Apple does a really good job of making really complex systems very simple, right? And that's what we wanted to do with both the Gen 3 and the Gen 4 is the Gen 3 is just stupid simple, right? You turn it on. There's literally like four steps and it's just like A or B, A or B, A or B, and then boom, uh, you, you're you're inflating and then you disconnect and then you go. Like that is, and that's what we wanted out of it. We wanted it for somebody that maybe is not super technologically inclined. They don't really like technology. Um, they they love using the hand pump, you know, for, for BFR, which has its problems as well. Those things were not designed to handle back pressure when you go to reconnect it and the needles would break. Um, we found that out pretty quickly. Um, so we wanted something to, to kind of like appease those people. But then the 4.0 is kind of like for people that really love technology and really love, you know, that cool factor, the technology involved with it, all the modes you can do. Um, so yeah, so we, when we tested it, you know, I put together the screen frames, but just cause it works for me, doesn't mean it's going to work for the person next to me. So it has to be tested in software. It has to. And then ultimately I, I asked my fiance who's, she's a dermatologist, but she's not like a you know physical therapist or anything that's, you know, using this on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm like, what does this look for you? Like, how, did, how, how do you read it from the time you open the box to, you know, the directions, whether it be the user manual, the quick start guide, is there anywhere that's going to trip you up? Because I'm going to, I'm way too attached. So I'm going to know exactly how to use this, but I am not going to, I cannot put myself in the customer's point of view that has never seen this thing before, where there's any lapses in, in communication. And so, yeah, she'll be like, yeah, this is confusing. Like, Step one to step two, what there should be something in between you're missing something here. Um, or, you know, the screens don't flow, you know, super cleanly, right? So like the button may be misplaced, or I don't understand what this means. Why are you using this verbiage? This doesn't make sense. Um, so we had a, you know, there was some cleaning up to do. Um, and then obviously customer feedback, you know, we have people are more than willing to offer their opinion on user interface and user experience, uh, which is great. You know, I welcome it. I love it because it's like, eh, I never thought of that. And then, or I'm just like, yeah, we thought of that, but this is why we didn't do that because then you have, you're, you're kind of fixing one problem and then creating another. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's a balance, just, you have to appease that middle 80 to 90%. And then that, you know, that 10% that's left, it's kind of like, yeah, it's, it's it, you going back to our original conversation, you cannot appease everybody. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely something just to accept and, and kind of go from there. Now, mm -hmm. also with your product, you have a, you have a clinician and a regular person, non -pre provider option um why why did you make that dist distinction how 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 can you trust people that you know are are trying to buy the clinician model and right. are not clinicians and yeah. and kind of talk about that that kind of deviation in the product line yeah so the 4.0 um when you first get it you sort of sign up for the app it asks you if you're a clinician or you know not clinician basically and if you're a non-clinician um it has some restrictions right so you can't just jump right into manual mode um, it forces you to find LOP for that given limb, whether it be right, le right arm, left arm, right leg, uh, left leg. Uh, and then it remembers that LOP so you don't have to do that every time, right? Um, it, it frustrates me to no end when people are, are like, we find LOP not only every session, sometimes people will find LOP multiple times in a session. I'm like, what do you do? They're like, it takes forever. I'm like, well, yeah, because it wasn't designed to find LOP uh, 
during the session multiple times, let alone every session with that given patient. I'm like, you don't need to do that. Like it's not designed for that. We it's slower process because it, it we want to make sure it's accurate. So you don't have to do this every single time. Um, and I know that's like one of your huge pet peeves is when people are like over LP calibrate, I guess you could mm -hmm. say. Um, drives me crazy. I know it drives you crazy. Yeah. Um, they're like, well, we're trying to be as safe as possible. I'm like I get the safety point of view, but like, as long as you're screening these patients properly and excluding out any kind of red flags and you're finding the LOP, you know, for that, for that one, you know, in, in their first session, you don't need to do it every single session or multiple times in a session, maybe once every couple of weeks, once every, you know, once every month, once every few months, depending on their, their, um, their health. Yeah. I mean, listen, it's, I think that a lot of this has to do with a, a, a lack of knowledge of what specifically is is the process, why you're doing the process. And I think that's the education arm uh, yeah. being able to be effectively communicated that you are, in essence, applying a tourniquet, but it's a modified approach to a strict tourniquet application where mm -hmm. you're, you're not you're using a wider cuff. You're not inflating it for a very high amount of pressure. So you're always subocclusive, but that you know the the main determinants of getting that applied pressure is the cuff width, the limb circumference, and your blood pressure. Yeah. Your blood pressure will change during exercise, but we don't necessarily think that. And this is my bias that I've kind of come into more and more, which is that. Um, that BFR is really about or the relativized pressure is really about during the rest periods, not the contraction periods, because when you're using a load that is between 20 and 30%, you're getting microvascular occlusion naturally. So it's really about preventing those metabolites from leaving and inducing their effects in an accelerated capacity right. to to really get that effect. So I'm, I'm not as much of a high pressure proponent in most circumstances, not all, but most. And yeah. so it's, it, it's getting that communicated effectively. And, and like the fact is like your limb might even increase from a BFR session and your blood pressure might increase. But at the end of the day, do, do again, I, I'm more of a moderate pressure type person. Anyways, it's not sure. like we're really trying to, push the limit on, on pressure application. Cause you're just not comfortable. And yeah. then as somebody who's, who's, who, who like, who teaches BFR researches BFR and uses BFR pretty consistently. Even me, I'm like, I've been doing 60%, you know, at most and still getting a benefit and, yeah. and, and, but still also being like, uh, I'm like not looking forward to, to doing the, the BFR. It's just been, much more refreshing to have accessible technology that I can yeah. bring in a gym to be able to inflate and, and, and get going. And as, go. as yeah. I mean, I think we talked about it before. Like, I think it's, I think it, it's going to be in maybe even a few years, maybe longer, but it's going to just be 50 to 60% LOP regardless of the limb. I mean, that's, that's kind of yeah, where everything's trending. That's basically where, you know, the research that I'm conducting is, is, mm -hmm using 60% of supine and we're actively investigating uh, whether or not the position of LP matters and mm -hmm. its impact on performance and, and perceptual and hemodynamics. So we're mm -hmm. trying to really piece out, uh, piece out the methodological applications of that. Mm -hmm. um, the last thing I wanted to talk about regarding your cuff is you, you have shifted from the gen three to the gen four, particularly in the lower body with the shape of the cuff, mm -hmm. um, being more contoured in the lower body and straight and a little bit less wide in the upper body. Can you yeah. talk about the decisions that, that, that underlie that, you know, that. Yeah. Thing? Yeah. I mean, so having a curved shape cuff, uh, just better fits the limb. Um, you know, it wasn't so much for, like lowering the pressure or anything like that. Yeah, there is lower LP, but it's, I don't want to say it's, it's not that super significant. It's you know? not it's about it, it, like 10 millimeters of mercury or max. something. Max. Yeah, yeah. It's like five to 10. So it wasn't really for that reason. It was really for fit and comfort. It is significantly more comfortable um, because the pressure, 
the air pressure is is more evenly dispersed. Um, if you inf if you take our 3.0 cuff and you take our 4.0 cuff and you inflate it to say 200 and put it on your leg, the 3.0 cuff when it inflates, there's going to be like an overhang because the limb is cylindrical and the cuff is straight. So it doesn't account for the cylindrical shape of the limb. So you're going to have an overhang of maybe an inch. So uh, really that four inch cuff is really like three and a half as far as surface area where that pressure or maybe in three inches where the, uh, the surface area where that pressure is actually in contact with the limb. Um, with the 4.0, it's the full four inches is is fully in contact with the limb as far as pressure goes uh, because it, it accounts for that cylindrical shape of the limb. So, and it, it, it's pre-curled too. So uh, the slip outs we used to have uh, with the 3.0 um, kind of like slip outs of the of the uh of the cuff the the 4.0 that's kind of negated just because there's a pre-curl so it's when it's on your limb before you even strap it down it's it's pretty tight or it's pretty you know snug um and then just tightening it is just you know that's just going to be that extra you know you know reinforcement to to preventing it from slipping uh, but yeah we we uh it, it's much more comfortable fits better um pressures are more comfortable um, that's generally why we did it that way. And as far as the arm goes, as far as the width goes, it's just more of a sweet spot, you know? Um, you know, we didn't want to do something super narrow and then it's impossible to find LOP or if you're able to find LOP, it's, it's very high. Um, and we didn't want to do something too wide. It, it, then your bicep is literally pushing out against the cuff and like, it's, it's super uncomfortable for starters. Uh, and two, uh, you're stressing the cuff designed to its limits you're going to really reduce the lifespan of that cuff because you are putting an immense amount of pressure back into the cuff and the cuff's trying to maintain its inflation so it's battling between the air pressure in the bladder and then then your muscle pushing against it and then the seams on the bladder are like hanging on for dear life so like that is or the weld rather so like that is like that's the battle that's going on so we're just like wow this is really uncomfortable and not great for the cuff so we designed something to where we felt like it's a sweet spot. Is it going to work for a hundred percent of people? No. Is it going to work for probably 90% of people's biceps or, or I'm sorry, their arms? Yes. It's going to fit kind of pretty snugly between that, that deltoid and uh, that top part of the bicep. Uh, so that's kind of why we kind of fell on that two and three fourths inch uh, width of a cuff um, for the 4.0, uh, just because we felt that that is a sweet spot. Yeah, so let's talk one more thing about your cuff, and then sure. I want to ask like some questions, just rapid fire as we kind of sure. wind down. Sure. Um, so the one thing also that I I personally like about your cuff is the fact that um, when you first of all it has three modes: the continuous, mm -hmm. intermittent, and resting. So I'd like you to talk about why you decided to do that, and then the mm -hmm. second thing is. I, I, I like how when you're in continuous mode and you finish a set, it mm -hmm. reinflates and kind of, um, gets you back to whatever mm -hmm. that applied pressure. Can you talk yeah, about yeah. why you made that decision sure. and what potential utility it has when you're applying BFR? Yeah. So, yeah. So intermittent resting BFR, um, I believe they're relatively new. I want to say resting is probably newer, um, not a ton of research on it. The intermittent was always kind of interesting to me. Um, I found myself doing intermittent with the Gen 3. And it's not, Gen, Gen 3 is not ideal to do intermittent BFR just because you have to inflate each cuff at, you know, one time, you know, or, or at this, at, you can't do two cuffs at the same time. So that is where we're just like, okay, I love doing intermittent. I find it more comfortable. I don't really see the too much of a difference in results between continuous and intermittent. I know there's some differences as far as in the research goes. Um, but as far as like me personally, I like intermittent. It's more comfortable. Um, I still get that pump. So, I mean, that's kind of what, you know, I use it for, right. I'm not really rehabbing any injuries or anything. Um, I do have shoulder issues. So I, I, I try to keep it light. Um, so I, I, yeah, so I use intermittent a lot. So I want to incorporate that in the 4.0 and the resting BFR is there for people to, to increase the, the, um, the uptake in BFR with a, a certain patient population. So those patient populations that just deconditioned, 
don't want to exercise or they're, they're kind of, you know, they're just, you know, those type of patients, right? So like the resting BFR really kind of eases them into BFR. Right? So resting BFR is your, your, the pressure, there's no pressure during the exercise. It's only inflated the rest period. So they're kind of just getting acclimated to having a cuff on themselves, having a cuff uh, under pressure, but not while they're exercising. So it just gets them acclimated, right? And then maybe use that for the first session and then the second session do intermittent and then see how they respond to that. Um, you know, and then continuous mode is, you know, we use that you know, sometimes in the, uh, you recommend it sometimes in the clinic, but also mainly for like fitness, general fitness, um, you know, people that are trying to put a lot of systemic stress on their, on their, on their bodies, whether they're doing anaerobic or aerobic exercise. So that, that's why that's there for it. So giving them options and control of those options, that was the goal with the 4.0. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and as far as, yeah, with the 4.0 at the end of each set, um, and at the start of each set, it will, um, but you have to press the button. So it's kind of like a manual regulation. You're, you're, it inflates that given pressure, uh, that you started at. Uh, that that's really to account for any pressure, um, air, air movement in the cuff. Uh, there is some air movement in the cuff. Um, you're going to have that with the 3.0 or 4.0, any cuff. So like you inflate it and these cuffs, so people think like it is like an absolute airtight. There's nothing that's airtight. Okay. So like you, you inflate something to like 200, if you inflate a raft to like 200, you know, millimeters of mercury pressure, there's going to be some leak. There's a reason why it eventually will deflate out. Whether it be small leak, large leaks, there's going to be leaks. Uh, air, air is very tricky to, to fully keep in, um, especially when you're pushing against it uh, under load, right? So like it, it's going to leak. Um, is that leak significant or affect your gains? No. Um, it's not, it's not like you're going to inflate it to 200 and then it's going to drop to 100 after a set. If that happens, that's a, that's a significant leak. And that is not within the tolerance of what is deemed effective. Um, you know, with ours, we, you know, we, and we account for that both in the algorithm, but and also, um, in the actual general use of the app, um, mainly just to maintain consistency. That's the biggest thing. Right. So with LOP, you're maintaining consistency throughout all your patients. So, you know, you're personalizing that pressure for that given patient. Yeah, no, great. I mean, that's um, that's that's awesome. It's uh, I think it's a nice feature for sure to um, to incorporate. Um, so before we get to the rapid fire questions, is there any yeah. anything else that you briefly want to talk about or wrap up and in and, and like no, I mean, not really. I mean, just, I'm really excited. I, I'm really happy. You know, there's nothing more fulfilling when people are like come to me and be like, Hey, you know, these cuffs, like patients, right. These cuffs help me tremendously in my rehab and I love them. And I want to get a set of my own because, you know, my, my, my PT has them and I want a set, or I have clinicians come to me like, Hey, this has really increased my referrals. Um, you know, and I really like this product. I've used others before. And that that's the best part is when they're like, yeah, I use other cuffs before, but yours is the best. So like, I mean, just from a competitive nature, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I'm i not like, yeah, I'm, competition is healthy. It, it improves everybody, mm -hmm. right? So it's great to have competition on the market that improves everybody, adds modes. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I want to, I want to bury all of them. I mean, that's just, that's yeah, I mean, listen, just, I, if you I, don't I, have that, in, I'm sorry, but if you don't have that, that mentality, um, you know, yeah. all right. So these questions are just going to come off top of my head, but, sure. um, I'm going to put you on the spot. So we talked a lot about, um, we took, talked a lot about the, the, the pros of your cuff. If you had to yes. name one or two cons for the people that are listening to this podcast or watching the podcast, what mm -hmm. would they be from the creator and mm -hmm. how could you go about addressing these in a future capacity to make the product sure. even better or a new product even better? Sure. Yeah. That's a really good question. Um, hmm. I can think of one already. Um, probably a faster inflation. That's exactly the one that, that I would probably would. be mine. Um, right. That that would be a little change into our supply chain because then we would have to use a larger pump. But I would say, yeah, larger in um, 
Uh, faster inflation would be my number one. That's really the only thing I would improve would be the, be the 3.0 or the 4.0 uh, would be the speed of inflation just to just keep pushing the the efficiency up. Yeah, I'll add another one. I think that while the sizing, and you mentioned this before, tends mm -hmm. to get a lot of people, I think yeah. that the, the the movement from five cuffs in the Gen 2, which really got everybody, yeah. um, to the four in the Gen 3 and um, like the three. Eight, the, the, four. <laughs> three, yeah, so there's three, in there's three, three in the 3.0 or four in yeah. the 4.0. Yeah. So I think, I think that, and I, I think that, from my understanding, um, was probably a way to keep the cost down to the consumer. Um, well, the 4.0, we went to four sizes to prevent the excessive gap. I'm sorry, the excessive overlap that we were running in with the 3.0. So the 3.0, um, what we were finding is that, especially for the arms, there's too much overlap. And when there's too much overlap, it affects the LOP calibration. So we went with a um, small, medium, large, and XL for the 4.0 to kind of cover our bases. Um, we're going to come out with an XXL cuff for the 4.0, probably later this year, early next year. Um, I think that'll take... solve a ton of, a yeah, ton of... I mean, yeah, that, that, that XXL will be 34 inch cuff. So that's really only going to be used by like our NFL guys that we work with. Um, I just had an NFL team reach out yesterday and they're like, Hey, we need something that's larger than your XL cuff and the 4.0. I'm like, well, go with the 3.0 because we do sell a 34 inch cuff um, mm -hmm. with the 3.0. Um, that would be my recommendation. But in the meantime, but yeah, I told them, yeah, for the 4.0, we are going to have a 34 inch cuff. Um, it would have to inflate faster. So there's some challenges to that. You go, it, We can increase the size pretty easily. It's maintaining its function or being on par with the rest of the size is a little bit different because it's a much, much larger volume of air there. Yeah. I mean, I would say, I would say that, that overall, like the upper body applications for mm -hmm. the cuff, I'm, I've been extremely happy with. Um, oh, that's good to hear. I really, um, I've been very happy with it from just all, all across the board. I think you nailed kind of my main criticism, which is more of a, a hardware thing than anything. Mm -hmm. sure. Um, but but understandably, I, I get why there's there's the trade offs with that. Um, so that would yeah. be biggest, that yeah. would be the biggest thing for me. Okay. Yeah. Next question. So mm -hmm. where where name five or four or five organizations that your smart cuffs are being used right now um, in professional athletics yeah. or. Uh, well, one, we just launched a partnership with USA weightlifting for the Paris Olympics. So that was pretty big. Um, they came to us or like, Hey, we've been using your cuff for years. Um, it'd be weird if we went with a different BFR sponsor. Uh, so let's make this work. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you guys have been using us for quite a while. Um, I didn't know that was available. So, uh, we launched our official partnership with them. I think like a month ago, maybe a month and a half ago. Uh, so we outfitted, um, all their athletes or in the process of, um, with the 4.0 because they already have the 3.0, um, you know, for the Paris Olympics. So we're excited about that. Um, organizations, gosh, I mean, there's so many, uh, baseball teams, NFL teams and NBA teams that are using our, our, our products. I would say probably in each league, I would say anywhere between 30 and 60% of the teams, depending on the league are using our product. Um, the really cool thing is when people reach out or purchase off the website that you didn't expect. Like, um, like Megan Rapino, um, I'm like, what? And then certain heads of TV networks, uh, that's another one, uh, that was pretty cool. Um, yeah, I can't say that. I can't say yeah, that. Yeah, of course. Of the network. But, uh, but yeah, so it, that's pretty cool. Right. Um, so that was, that, those are always fun. So, uh, as far as uh, LeBron James, that's another one. Um, and then, um, our guy out in LA, um, at uh, at rise uh mm -hmm. he 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 treats a lot of um celebrities actors actors and actresses so that was really cool um you know having it on you know miles teller for top uh, training for top gun or liam hemsworth when he's training for independence day two i love that movie not everybody does but i loved it uh i'm an independence day fan <laughs> uh yeah movie quality aside um and then uh yeah and captain marvel herself uh she was using it uh, when she was filming in london so um, 
Yeah. So those are really cool. Yeah. So having those like connections and then, you know, having connections with these sports teams that, you know, especially our hometown teams like here in Cleveland, we're, you know, with the Indians, Guardians, Indians, um, Cavs and Browns, like having being in those. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And going into those, you know, I've been fans of those teams my entire life. So going, being able to go into those training facilities and talking with, you know, working with these athletes, um, you know, the Cavs, especially the Cavs are like 10 minutes from my house. So like I just drive over there and I'm meeting with, you know, their head strength coach, um, shout out to Derek. Uh, Derek's awesome. Um, he's like, Hey, yeah, we're working with, you know, Evan or we're working with Darius. So like, what do we do for, you know, this protocol? Like, you know, cause they're, they're more like, mm-hmm. they're just different, right? These guys are seven feet, 250s, 80 pounds, right? These guys are huge. Like they're in they're, they're the different needs. So those are, those are cool. Those are, those are the cool connections that we made, uh, you know, over the years. Price of your cuffs, gen three and gen yes. four. Yeah. What are the prices? Oh, sorry. I was like, Oh, are we going to increase or decrease? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, I mean, to that point, we we don't plan to increase it. Um, even if um, even if Trump takes office, I don't know if anybody heard about that. <laughs> from a uh, from a production point of view, that may not be aware. He wants to increase the tariffs to sixty percent. So, um, but uh, since ours are, you know, we we make ours in the U.S., we're 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 immune to that. So other products might increase. Um, ours will not. Um, so price, um, the Gen three consumer model uh, for for patients. And athletes um, that are non-clinical, uh, those start at $299 and then the full set goes to $499. So that's a pump and four cuffs for $499, a pump and two cuffs for $299. Um, and then the uh, 3.0 Pro model, uh, which we recommend for clinical market, um, doesn't force you to find LOP. It's got a lot of other, it's got IPC modes, so it's got other benefits to it. Um, that starts at $999 for the full set. So that's one Pro pump and six cuffs, so a pair of each size. Um, we have a Pro Elite set for uh, $14.99. That's two pro pumps and a pair of each size. And then the uh the 4.0 uh that ranges from $4.99 to $16.99, depending on which set you get. Um, we have sets of two, four, and eight cups. So um wide variety, and we did it that way because we have clinical market and then we have patient athlete market. Um, there's a different price points and different sets. Um, so it kind of appeases everybody. Okay. Research. Are you actively yes. collaborating with any research groups? What are yeah. what are the focuses of that research? If you can divulge, yeah, um, yeah, we do from time to time. You know, they'll reach out, either wanting a discount or you know, donation or whatever. Um, yeah, sometimes they reach out and kind of want. It's a little frustrating when they want to keep just doing the same thing over and over again. Um, I get there's a need for it in certain cases. Um, but when something's been done like eight times, it's like enough is enough. Uh, we, we kind of beat a dead horse. We, we got it. It, you know, it works. Um, um, so then you're kind of just like, yeah, they're just trying to get published or something like that. But other one, other times I would say the newest stuff, I get so much question, so many questions about cerebral palsy. Um, I get a lot about that. I had no idea how much rehab's involved with that. Um, Mm -hmm. so that was, that was a learning experience. So that's pretty cool um we used, yeah, we used your cuffs for our cerebral palsy uh yeah p series so right and that was right around the same time i was telling you about like hey there's a lot of like cerebral palsy stuff and i hadn't i had no idea um so that was really cool um cerebral palsy stuff uh g- neurological in general um i feel like a lot that has been an uptick bfr with neurological conditions um, so it's kind of moving away from the days of like, you know, validation, you know, like, are you doing LOP? It's like, we're kind of past that. It's like, yeah, it's been validated for LOP. LOP works. That's kind of like the gold standard for BFR. These are the general, you know, outline of rep and set schemes. I know you've been working with those uh, as well. So those are, those are being modified as well constantly um, because it's, it's going to be use dependent. But like it's moving towards like okay, what other conditions can benefit from this? I think that's that's really untapped. Mm-hmm. It's five years from now. Where do you see smart tools? Five years from now, um, probably five years from now, I have probably two more products on the market. 
um, in, in, in non BFR products, right? So they're going to be clinical fitness products, um, that, you know, that I have on my docket, um, that I want to do. Um, it's, it's, it's good to have ideas. Um, it's another thing to have actionable, realistic ideas. <laughs> um, there's certain markets that are just like, wow, that's gonna be really expensive to get into, uh, or that product's not going to be feasible, uh, from a supply chain issue or storage issue or shipping issue. Um, there's just, there's just challenges, right? Um, so there's a couple products that we feel really good about. Um, like I said, we've already started our next product about four, four months ago, we started developing uh, our next product. So I'm super excited about it uh, just because it's right in my wheelhouse of exercise fizz. Um, it's an exercise product, you know, no secret about that. Um, but uh, so I'm, yeah, I'm really excited about it because, um, you know, people, I just don't want us to be a one product company or people to think of us as just an ISTM company, a BFR company. Um, yeah. And it's just to keep growing. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, it's a fun ride, you know, people that you meet places you go, you know, the, you know, and, and the, and the cut, cut, talking to customers. Um, it's, I never thought I'd be doing this. I'll just put it that way. I never thought I'd be doing it. Um, I just thought I was just going to kind of sell tools on the side and be a chiropractor and then just, you know, treat my patients and then, and then go home. Uh, now I, uh, I work 12 hours a day, six days a week, uh, pretty much. Uh, Sundays are really my only time. I kind of just like take off um, and just shut it down. Um, so yeah, that comes with this other stresses. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, wrapping up, is there any last things you want to say to the, to, to really uh, bottle? I don't even know what, what do you call it? Like, uh, summarize not Again. really i mean Again. i just appreciate you what you guys you know what you do um you know being as passionate you are about bfr right i mean it's it's um it's a brand new thing people have questions and for us you know we do the best we can as far as getting a quality product out there getting more education out there i know you're doing education obviously and in in a kind of a a mouthpiece or a voice for bfr research and kind of bridging the research with real world clinical application and that is where um that's a sweet spot you know and that's 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 the goal right making these very complex mechanisms simplified that that's that's the goal of all educators so. well it's always always a pleasure to uh talk BFR, hopefully the sure. audience kind of sees the intricacies associated with putting a product out there. Um, where can people find you? Uh, smart, yeah, smart tools plus smart tools plus.com. Um, or just Google smart tools, Google smart cuffs. Um, we'll, we pop right up. Um, yeah, smart tools plus. I would love to have smart tools, the URL, but it's taken already. Um, but <laughs> that was taken a long ago before I even started the company. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's where you can find us. Uh, we're on Instagram, smart tools, USA. Um, so we have a nice following there. Um, yeah, just feel free to email me. I answer emails all day, every day. Um, I try to answer everything within a 24 hour period. Um, so at the end of my day, I don't have any open emails. Um, I try to do the best I can um, with that, but uh, yeah. So just trying to customer service, trying to keep people keep people happy and answer all their their concerns and questions is is obviously paramount. All right. Well, thank you again, Nick, for your time. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, it was good. It was great. Appreciate it. And that's the Alrighty. episode. And that was today's episode of the BFR Better for Results podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, I would love if you subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you're watching or listening on. I really appreciate the support.